life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Good day and welcome to our next The Walking Dead podcast. I am Marshall. I am Lainey. No Corey today, just the two of us. Today we are talking about Season 2, Episode 10, 18 Miles Out. There's a lot of numbers going on there. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, I do have to say, in watching this episode, I feel like I didn't remember a lot of this episode, which is weird because there is kind of some major stuff happening in the middle of it, but... I don't know. I didn't remember a lot about this episode. This is kind of a transitory episode in that a lot of what is going on here is setting the stage for a final conflict. It, Even though the events that caused this to happen already happened, this is what's leading there. Yeah. It's the road to the end. Yeah, like how long until Shane implodes type thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. So a little bit about this episode. It originally aired on AMC in the United States on February 26, 2012. The episode was written by Scott M. Gimple and the series showrunner Glenn Mazzara. And it was directed by Ernest Dickerson. And it obtained the highest rating in the 18 to 49 demographic out of any cable telecast of the day, but was the second most viewed cable television program of the week because of the 2012 NBA All-Star Game. It's NBA. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Director Ernest R. Dickerson said it was a struggle to prevent John Bernathal and Andrew Lincoln (laughs) from doing their own stunts. I thought that was hysterical. Because if you watch watch this and they are like, they are in it, man. (laughs) I can just like be, I can can totally see both of them like, Mm -hmm. no, no, I want to do this. No. (laughs) Insurance says no. The episode is structured similarly to the Breaking Bad episode four days out. Alan Seppenwall of HitFix wrote, 18 Miles Out has a title that's very similar to Four Days Out, one of the most memorable episodes of Breaking Bad, and a structure that's relatively similar. Our two leads go on a long drive together for what should be a routine bit of business, have a lot of conversations about where they are at this point, and then hit a major obstacle that might keep them from driving home alive. Yeah, I I see that. They've already said that Breaking Bad kind of takes place in the same universe as The Walking Dead, and there is a lot of crossover hints and connections there, so that's pretty fun. I didn't watch Breaking Bad, so I like finding these kind of things that tell me more about the connections. Yeah. Are you ever interested in watching that show? I've tried. You tried. Didn't like it. I have not really watched it, but I feel like it would probably just kind of set me off. It might. Yeah, it might. I mean, it might also be like... It always is for me. The mood that I'm in often dictates if I like a show or not. Um, I could give it a try at another point and see if I like it, but I don't know. I don't know. We open in a scene that is uh, from later on in the episode, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we are starting with it. I I can't remember the actual term for... Oh, it's called In Media Res called in the middle of things. So that's the term for when you go to something in the middle and then come back to it later. Well, actually, in media rest means that you're starting in the middle of an action. So it's typically like, oh, somebody's running or somebody's shooting. That's in media rest. Oh, gotcha. But what what we're kind of dealing with here is... We we see it a lot in Sam Spade novels. This is is a Spadeism where you Mm -hmm. start near the end of the story when things are really bad and then go, how did I get here? Yeah, eight hours previously. Exactly. So Shane and Rick are at the Mert County Public Works uh, area. They are running from zombies in a yard with vehicles and the Mert County Public Works is at 730 Pimento Avenue in Griffin, Georgia, 30224. It is currently, as in today, the American Tanning and Leather Tannery yard and building. Randall is kind of dragging himself along the ground because his hands are bound. And Shane runs past a truck 
with the county seal of Merck County. At the time, I did not know what was on the seal, but then since then, I figured out where it was that they were that they were at the Merck County Public Works. Yep. Uh, then Shane runs into a bus. There is a weird continuity thing when this scene is shown later on. But right now, he's running into the bus and he's having a great amount of difficulty closing the door against the walkers. But later on, that's not what happens. We'll talk about that later. We're going to now really start at the beginning of this episode where we're at the road. Rick and Shane have Randall in the back trunk of his... I think it's the trunk of the yeah, car, right? Yeah, they have right? him in the trunk. And they stop at an intersection on the road. The sign says Southern Baptist Church of the Brethren. It was so hard to see this. Marshall and I worked for quite a while trying to figure out exactly what this was a sign for. But here's where it gets interesting. The Southern Baptist Church of the Brethren does not exist. Really. Those are actually two different denominations. Completely. Uh, I did find that the intersection that they are at is 1557 Luther Bailey Road in Sonoya, Georgia, and the intersection to Old Highway 85. If you uh, remember that the church that they stopped at early on in the season where they heard the bells and they were going to try to find uh, Sophia and there were three zombies in the church and they ended up killing him. That was the Southern Baptist Church of the Holy Light, which is at 2325 Luther Bailey Road, and is probably the church that this is referencing, because if you look at this on Google Maps, uh, the arrow that is pointing, the direction that the arrow is pointing in, is towards that church. Yeah. Yeah, getting this information was really nuts, because we kind of had to... We brought it up on our Netflix on the main television in our office, had to rewire it through into my computer so that I could take a shot and enhance it and zoom in. I'm like, that kind of looks like the word brethren, maybe. (laughs) I think. (laughs) Yeah. It it was kind of crazy. Yeah, so we're pretty sure that they're talking about the other church there um, and that they are just, you know, they they made that sign and stuck it up there for whatever reason. Mm Mm-hmm. So after they stop and get out, Shane says that he thought they were going further. And Rick says they are. They're going 18 miles out. Well, hey, now we know where the title comes from. Correct. Rick wants to talk to Shane but and says he's been waiting a week. So it's been a week since they brought Randall to the farm, which I don't know what... I'm sure they've been, like, trying to heal his leg, I guess. Yeah, well, especially considering it just got ripped through with an arrow in two different direct Not arrow, with, with a huge frog point arrow thing. Right, thing. yeah. And that's going to tear his leg up. Tore up. So I'm kind of surprised he's even walking. Right. Rick wants to talk about Otis, and he asked Shane if what he did to Otis was for survival. Mm-hmm. In a way. (laughs) Shane totally gives up that only one could make it out, and he shot Otis in the leg. Because he knew it couldn't be him. Unfortunately, he he knew. He knew he wouldn't be able to do it unless he he killed Otis. Right. Shane says he can't expect to live and be the good guy. And I really wonder why that's the case. (laughs) But also, what's funny is that Rick technically isn't a good guy if you really want to think about it in an unbiased way he has shot more living people than shane has but his intentions are different yeah because the people that he killed were shooting at him right yeah Yeah. so rick also think says that Lori says that shane is dangerous and he almost says that shane is not going to be dangerous yeah he he's like shane you're not going to be dangerous anymore like, this is kind of like him saying, you know, straighten up. Mm-hmm. But he's talking in Shane's language. So many times we've seen in this series that Shane comes up to somebody and tells them the quote-unquote truth. Mm-hmm. Tells them the way that it's going to be as a threat. And this is what Rick is doing now. Right. He's saying, okay, you're going to have to stop this. And if you stop this, we'll treat it like it never happened. 
but if you don't stop this, we're going to have a problem. Right. He also says that strength can come in restraint. And I think that's a that's very, very true. Yes. Sometimes in order to show restraint, you have to have more strength. You know, letting go is... And being a crazy like, ah, is very easy, but... It's very easy to just do things in fear. But to just stop and be like, no, I'm not. Mm. Yeah. Shane says that he didn't look at Lori before Rick got shot and that Lori and Carl kept him alive. And this, in my opinion, is a total lie. Because if you look at the flashback scene where Lori is in front of the school about to go pick up Carl and she's talking to that other woman and Shane rolls up to tell her that Rick has had an accident, Shane is definitely looking at Lori in that way already. Yeah, I agree. Randall has some headphones on in the trunk, and Rick goes on in there to check Randall's ropes. And they're playing some rock music on there. Um, And just so you know, rock music is not only really good for drowning out conversations in the car and road noise, but it's also a form of torture. Um, Loud rock music and strobe lights are used to keep prisoners awake for long periods of time. In fact, it is banned by the Third Geneva Convention. Uh, You cannot use this on prisoners anymore. So Rick and Shane are now war criminals. The music that's playing is Lazy Bones by Wooden Ships. And here's a few lyrics from that. Double down and I choke. Take me down for good. I got a lot to bear. Underneath. Lighting all the fires. Watch them burn into the night. Those are the uh, the lyrics we hear, but I did some research into the song itself, and the song is about the consequences of an apocalyptic nuclear war. Mm. Two survivors meet on the road, and they're from different sides, and both of them are like, "Um, who really won this war? I can't tell, because it looks like we all came out losers. Um, The song is likened to Tom Lehrer's We Will All Go Together When We Go, which is a personal favorite of mine. Is it? Yes. It's a very funny take on total nuclear annihilation. Okay. Yeah. When we visit the farmhouse, Maggie and Lori are making food in the kitchen. Looks like they're making some chicken, some tomatoes, and some cucumbers. And they are talking about Glenn saying he choked and froze because Maggie said, I love you. Lori says that the men always like to blame the women when it comes to those things. Yeah, you know, you shouldn't have said that because look what it made me do. Yeah, Uh uh-huh. Lori is really connecting to Maggie as like almost the significant others of the leaders or potential leaders of who is becoming whom in this whole universe. She also says, don't say man up. It doesn't go over well. No, it really never does. If a guy does need to man up, telling him to man up doesn't work. No, it, you know, it hurts their delicate constitutions. It does. So on the road, still, Rick says they need to start using the knives more. I mean, that's a duh. <laughs> and this is really the first conversation that they start having about tactics in this apocalypse. Like, how are we going to continue to survive in a sustainable way? Mm -hmm. And I like that. Mm -hmm. They talk about how they're going to stock up for winter. And they need to prepare because even though they're in Georgia, you know, it still snows in Georgia. So it could be kind of cold. And I kept thinking, does the cold affect the walker? And it, this kind of depends on the mechanism of zombieism. Uh, if you're talking about the living zombies, like they're alive, but they're infected with a, a virus, definitely three hours of exposure will kill them in sub-zero temperatures, um, just like a normal person would. Mm-hmm. A Walking Dead-style zombie may still be affected by the cold. If it gets too cold, their blood will start to crystallize because it doesn't flow like a living person's does. And that crystallized blood is going to shred their cells from the inside out as they move. If we're talking about like an Evil Dead style zombie, uh, all bets are off. Oh, gotcha. So as they are talking, Shane is looking out the window and he sees a walker on the passenger side of the car road, off in the field. This walker is played by one of the makeup artists and we do see him later as well in a completely different area and a completely different scene as a completely different zombie. (laughs) (laughs) But <laughs> <laughs> that does happen. Um, then Rick tells the story about how his cousin got stuck on Old Highway 85 for 24 hours, taking a cake to his girlfriend at Georgia Tech and listening to the Lord of the Rings book on tape twice. 
So, I did some math and some research about this. Let, lay it out. Lay it so out. So, this confirms that, number one, they are on Old Highway, 95, uh, Old Highway 85, uh, which we already knew from looking at the map. It usually takes about an hour to get to Georgia Tech from the intersection they were stopped at. Fellowship of the Rings takes 19 hours. I looked it up on Audible. I think it's funny they're talking about a book on tape because at this point there would be no apocalypse. They would still have Audible or mm-hmm. that kind of thing. It would have been an audio book. It takes 19 hours. So even if he listened to it at two times the speed, it would be almost 40 hours if he listened to it twice. Yeah. And, and if you listened it, to it at one and a half speed, like you know we typically do, it's 25.3 hours. So technically, he could have listened to it at one and a half speed in the 24 hours he was stuck. He just wouldn't have totally finished it. Yeah, exactly. But he knew how it ended because he listened to it twice, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all know how it ended. Toss the ring. Toss, toss it in. So at the farmhouse, Lori is bringing Beth food. Beth is still in shock, but she's not really just, you know, laying there, saying nothing, staring at the ceiling. That's not how she's actually talking now. And Beth uh, asks Lori, how how can she do that? How can she be pregnant? Um, And if being pregnant is even going to make a difference in the world that they live in right now. And Lori's like, I don't, you know, I don't know. We'll we'll just have to wait and see, basically. But will you eat this food? (laughs) And Beth is like, looking at it like, no, cannot eat. Yeah, she just, she's too depressed to eat at this point. So she's kind of dealing now with the loss of hope that we saw her go into catatonia over before. Right. She's She's trying to see, is there hope left in me to keep going? Right. Uh huh. When we revisit the road where they are driving, the car says they have now been at 18.6 miles in the trip. So you have that little trip odometer thing with a grand total of 225 miles in the trip. Mm-hmm. Looks like they have more than half a tank of gas and that the low and a low engine water temp. So they're they're doing okay. They're doing okay. Shane remarks that it looks like it's been more than 18 miles. No, it's been 18.6. Um, and Rick says he's looking for a place. So they find the Mert Public Works, which is actually 22 miles from the intersection they first stop at. So that's more, even more from the farm. Yeah. That's more than 18 miles out. Yeah, around so, about, you know. So Shane comments on the fact that there's something wrong with that odometer. Yes. <laughs> So they say they're going to leave Randall there and go scavenge for supplies because there's probably stuff around there. There's plenty of stuff in this public works. Mm-hmm. Like, even in one of the cars that you see there, I'm like, I take all of that. Exactly. They see a walker, just one lone walker, kind of coming up to them. And Shane goes to shoot it, but Rick reminds him, no, 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 we need to use the knives. Remember, I just said, we just had this conversation using the knives. So Rick cuts himself to get the walker to come over. And I'm thinking, is this really totally necessary? I mean, the guy already sees him. He's already heading that way. Why do you need to have blood in order to get them to come? Well, one thing that I do notice is that it goes, it's not just getting him to go there. It's about getting him into a particular spot on the fence. It seems like their primary method of hunting is through scent. So by putting that blood on the fence, it actually made the zombie try and eat that part of the fence. I don't care. I feel like it's still a bad risk, and we're going to talk about why later on. I saw that, and I agree wholeheartedly with you. This was unnecessary. Right. But that's probably why they're doing it. And also, I feel like if you're going to use your knife to kill, you need some kind of observant cloth with you at all times. Because, honestly, having that much blood and guts on your knife and then sticking it back in your sheath is gross. Yeah. You need to wipe it off before you put it back in the sheath. I'm Always. just saying. They then cut the lock on the gates with some cutters. Um, now, in general, I feel like this isn't always the best move because if it's overrun and you can't close it back up, there are more numbers for like a horde or they're coming after you, you can't shut them back up. 
But later I do see that this is a sliding gate, so they can kind of close it back up. And as long as they can relatch it, even if it's not locked, it should be okay because they will hit the gate and it won't like swing open or anything. Yeah. You can see that there's lots of eaten canned goods all over the ground. There's also a grass area with some burned bodies. Rick is just scoping it out, trying to figure out what is happening in this space. So this does look like some refugees did come here at some point um, because somebody was sitting here eating in large amounts. Mm. Shane finds the bus and it's empty and it seeds that it looks like people have been sleeping in it. There's a baby carrier as well. Lots of blankets, pillows. So people were driven here in bus loads to mm. be refugees. Outside, Shane then shoots some walkers in the head and notices that there are no bite marks on them. Mm -hmm. They think it has to be scratches that turned them, but are we sure? Especially considering what we know... Well, we, we didn't hear it from TS-19, but Rick knows from TS-19 that everybody's infected, and if you turn if you die, you turn zombie. Right. So I guess the question is, how did these guys die? More than likely, they either died from starvation or exposure or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the other things that we do notice is they took the two guys that they killed right at the beginning. They're both guards or cops and they've put them together on the ground and they're observing them they've taken off their duty belts and these have a lot of really useful things on them uh you've got additional guns you've got additional ammo each of them have a handcuffs flashlights they have radios um since they're here as guards they may actually have batons which are mm. super useful for a lot of things but the duty belts alone are useful yeah, yeah. We know that both Shane and Rick have been using their duty belts since the apocalypse. Having other people with these kinds of duty belts just makes it so that they can carry more effectively. Right. They can just grab whatever they need off their belts. I agree. Yeah. But at the farmhouse, though, Beth is crying. So Lori comes in to check on Beth and see she hasn't eaten the food that she gave her. She's telling Beth she needs to be strong. You know, she needs to eat. Uh, Lori brings the food back to the kitchen and she notices that the knife is not there. And Beth has taken that knife. She is intending suicide. Yes, she is. That's terrifying. Yes. And then we see the yard where Lori, at, Lori has put two and two together and asks if Andrea has seen Maggie or Herschel. And Maggie and Glenn, like, had just walked by the RV, like, 20 minutes before. But, A, I feel like this whole scene was kind of somewhat unnecessary. Right. And the other question I have is, where is Herschel? Like, we haven't seen... We, we don't see him the entire where episode. Where is Jimmy? Where is Jimmy? Where are any of these people? Yeah. Because there's also Dale. There's, there's a whole lot of characters that are just missing. Yeah. Where are they? No idea. They should be around. Yeah. At the public works, they attempt to let Randall go, although they don't untire him. They just leave him there. And they, like, kind of leave him a knife, like, in the proximity of him, but not within the ability for him to grab it. They start to walk away until he shouts out that he went to school with Maggie. He's like, I knew Maggie. She didn't know me, but I knew her. And that kind of makes him stop because they're like, wait... So shouldn't she have said something when she saw you all well, week what long? What really makes them stop is that he does say that everybody knew of Herschel. Mm -hmm. Which means... They know where the farm is. And they can't let him go free. Randall says he isn't like the other guys and he wouldn't hurt them. But then Shane points out that he knows where the farm is. So if he gets back to his people, Jane maybe... The elusive Jane. Who also that very, other very guy. Angry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he could lead them to the farm. So Shane tries to shoot him and Rick pushes him so he won't. At this point, a lot is happening. So I'm going to kind of take you through it. Um, I noticed that there is a big seal on one of the cop cars that says the police in Merck County was established in 1776. 
So I, I did say it was as old as me because I thought it said 1976. I'm just saying. And I was like, well, maybe maybe it was a typo. She she meant to type 1976. So I went and looked it up. No, it is 1776. I'm like, Lanny, you're 255 years old. Not what? to mention, I don't think that that police was established in 1776. They were. In Georgia? Yes. I looked them up. They were 1776. Merck County. That's crazy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Rick says they need to take Randall back to the farm and lock him in the barn. Uh, unless you bust it open. Because <laughs> Rick right. is just like giving him a, a little dig. Like, shut up. Shane says the right choice is the one that keeps him alive. And he doesn't think Rick can keep him safe. So there's the first burn that causes Rick to kind of lose it a little bit. Randall tries to make it to the knife on the ground. He's doing this, like, caterpillar crawl thing. Um, But but Rick and Shane are now in a full drag fight. Yeah. Full fight. During the fight, Shane yanks the motorcycle down on Rick. This is funny. Because in this fight sequence... Shane topples the motorcycle onto Rick's legs, temporarily immobilizing him. The motorcycle weighed an estimated 800 pounds. I found some of this uh, information like on Wikipedia and other sources. Um, so in order to decrease the weight of the vehicle, Dickerson and his team emptied the gas tank. Scallon Bacchus, the Walking Dead special effects technician, raked the vehicle's foot peg to prevent it from sliding and making contact with the actor's legs. Bacchus also added a rod with a secure stable so it would give further clearance to the actors and increase the motorcycle's height from the ground. The cameraman filmed the shots at an angle, creating the illusion that the vehicle did hit the actor's legs. And I kind of watched it. Mm -hmm. You can tell Rick is a little farther back from the actual motorcycle, but the way they shot it does look like it probably toppled And they made that shot really fast, so you have to be looking for it to catch it. The other thing I was trying to find, and I, I didn't quite catch it, was I found a note that someone had written where when Rick hits the ground the very first time they're fighting, that he has like an earpiece in his ear and it falls onto the ground. I couldn't find it, but apparently it happens in this scene as well. And then at this point, uh, there seems to be like 50 million guns. <laughs> I don't well, know it's because they, they kept on whacking the guns out of each other's hands. Right. So it went here, it went there, and then they had to keep on picking it up, and then they knocked it out, and now it's in a new spot. So Shane grabs the gun that that's under the truck, and he tries again to shoot Randall, and Rick tackles him again. Um, and then some point during this fight, Rick hits Shane in the head three times, and the last time it's like this yeah. sound. It, it's, it's gross. It's kind of gross, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> and then during this fight, like it does kind of focus a little bit more on Randall, but what you're hearing is the two guys growling and yelling at each other and they sound like walkers. Mm-hmm. And this also kind of takes us back to that scene much earlier in the episode when Shane is watching a walker walking by itself. And it almost seems like he's identifying with that walker. Yeah. This is kind of talking about how the fact that these two guys are fighting and they might not be any better than these walkers. They're just behaving on instinct now. Right. Randall does get to the knife and he's trying to cut his arm and his leg holds. Uh, Rick says he won't let Shane make any of these calls that he thinks he's going to make. He's not going to do it. Then Shane throws this large, large wrench at Rick and it breaks the window above his head. Then Shane looks at himself in the window and he looks very bloody and undead like, like you were saying, very Walker like, but I thought also he looks like Voldemort. I was looking for it there. And yeah, if you blended out the nose just a little bit, mm-hmm. yeah, kind of. He would. And then Walkers start to climb out the window. And uh, Rick stabs the first one that comes out with a knife, but then. But he has also left his knife for Randall. So what you can see here is that they're actually starting to learn and carrying multiple knives now. Right. Um, and this one is like, he had left a folder for Randall. No, it, it was a, a fixed blade for Randall. And he's got his folder, the one that he had used to cut open the zombie 
uh, for analysis while they were looking for Sophia. Mm-hmm. Um, then he grabs that ra- that walker and holds it over himself so that all the other zombies just pour over him and come right after Shane. There is a weird thing that I also was looking for in this scene that somebody put posted where when he goes to hit that walker in the head that the spring on the knife bounces a little too much and you can see that it kind of does this boom boom thing. <laughs> I didn't quite see it, but... <laughs> Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> when I read it, I was like, oh. Uh, we we turn to the farm for a very small scene, which is basically Maggie just yelling at Beth uh, for the decision she makes. I, I really don't blame Maggie for how she feels here. I mean, she's giving it to Beth in this very, like, stark manner. And I think some people do need some coddling, but some people need tough love. And I think she knows that right now, Beth... Might just need to be told what's what. She kind of does. And this is this is really tough. I'm going to tell you guys, if any of you are feeling a lack of hope, if any of you are feeling where Beth is right now, don't necessarily listen to us. Um, get help. Yes. There are resources, and I'm going to try and put those in the show notes. Definitely go talk to those people. I know I have been in that spot before mm-hmm. um, many times in my life where I'm running out of reasons to be around. Mm-hmm. And it does take knowing that it is not you anymore. Right, yeah. That these words are not your own and you need to have a good mirror, somebody who knows you to tell you truth but you also have to be receptive to it right and i would recommend get yourself some help before you make any choices at the public work shane is still running from zombies and one of the zombies that's following him sees randall who is trying to cut the rope from his legs and he veers off towards him i won't say him it looks like a female zombie but veers off towards randall Uh, Rick pushes the dead zombie from on top of him um, as a bunch of the other zombies are like coming out. But there is one last zombie who walks out and looks at Rick. This is, again, the makeup artist who was also playing the zombie who walked through the field. They look very different. Different zombie, but same Different makeup job. Yeah. Yeah. So the zombie falls and uh, that is going after Randall. And Randall kicks her arm and it just breaking bone Mm. thing is really gross he is trying to get his arms to the front of his body because they're tied together behind him and that way he can use the knife and he does kind of get it out underneath his legs to the front of his body and then he does kind of go around and he starts stabbing her with the knife and he's just like really putting way too much into this like he's really wanting to kill her for some reason for sure But then we really want to know what's going on with Beth. So at the farm, Andrea and Lori are in the kitchen listening to Beth and Maggie argue. Now through the window, you can clearly see that it's heavily snowing, although this episode takes place in the summer. It could also be raining. I'm going to put that out there. But there was precipitation coming from the ground. It looked like snow. Yeah. Andrea thinks Lori shouldn't have taken the knife away. She thinks that Dale taking away her decision to commit suicide when they were at the CDC is equated to Lori taking away Beth's decision. Now, in my opinion, Andrea is still thinking very selfishly about this whole situation. She's not thinking about how her decisions affect the whole group and just about what one individual wants out of their life. Yeah, this is very much... um... It's sitting here saying that this person deserves to have a choice, but they're not in a stable frame of mind. We do find out later that she's trying to force uh, Beth into making a choice and figuring out what she, at her depths, really wants. Mm -hmm. But this could lead to a situation where even if she makes a different choice, it might be too late. Correct. Correct. We will talk about that later on when yeah. we have that discussion, too. Lori sarcastically says that Andrea is such a productive member of the group. Um, and I think Lori, in this case, is trying to put Andrea in a traditional gender role. Um, you know, the men can handle you know this other stuff. You need to be doing the cooking and the cleaning and the laundry with everybody else. 
Um, but honestly, in this case, Andrea has been doing a ton of the heavy lifting. She cleared all the walkers from the barn, put it on, you know, the piles. She's been doing things that females don't typically think of in those roles. That doesn't mean she's contributed any less. It just means that she hasn't been contributing in what Lori wants her to do, which is laundry. Yeah. Um, and this is why these two characters are not really my faves. They are both very narrow-minded ways of thinking, and they're both very selfish in the way that they think. Yes. They think logistically without thinking about the good of what is happening to the people. Um, how do they can manipulate people to be what they want them to be in how we talked about Lori is manipulating, you know, Rick on how to respond to Shane. Andrea is manipulating Beth on how to respond to her suicidal thoughts. Yep. That kind of a thing. Um, and then Andrea calls out Lori for getting down with Shane. Kind of like she's almost bitter, but still very like, I don't know, just throwing it in her face. Yeah. Very like, we all knew about this kind of thing, right? And I find this whole conversation just kind of hilarious because these are two of the most ridiculous characters that we have. Right. Okay. Neither of them are villainous. They're just ridiculous in the way they're doing things. And they're going after each other because they each think that their self-centered point of view is the right one and the other person should be living their life according to it. Mm -hmm. So you have Lori and she's like, you need to be the housewife. And, you know, Andrea's like, well, we all need to be equal to the men, which isn't wrong, but she's like also very self-centered and people need to make their own choices, even if they're not ready to make those choices. Mm -hmm. And this just kind of cements why we don't like either one of these characters. For sure. Yeah. That it's just a, a wham fest. Yeah. At the public works, Rick is looking under the cars for another gun that got shoved under there. He starts shooting walkers, though. Again. Uh, he has two dead walkers on top of him, and he shoots a third through the first walker's head. But there's also a knife pretty close by. Yeah. But it's going to be a little difficult to reach around some of these, because he's got two zombies on top of him, and, mm -hmm. and the third one is just kind of a little bit of a reach. Right. But then also during this, like, this is... He takes three more shots afterwards, and that finishes off his gun. Yeah. And... While he's firing, you can hear the dry fires, but the hammer isn't clicking. Right. I think I made a note of that, but I couldn't figure out where that was happening. Yes, you're right. Uh, that Because I did get that off the internet somewhere else, I like to re-verify. I'm glad you found that. Mm -hmm. But at the farm, Maggie is still yelling at Beth. And Beth is just trying to justify it. And then she tries to get Maggie in on her Lewis suicide pack that she's trying to do. And she thinks the group, the rest of the group, won't protect her, Beth. She understands that Maggie might be slightly part of that group because of Glenn. But Beth doesn't feel that way. Well, okay, so first off, I understand. It, Beth is not in the right mind frame to hear that she's being stupid. Yeah. Um, and that maybe if she took some time to be a part of that group, they would. But on the other hand... Uh, it's stupid because she is a part of that group and she doesn't understand that Lori and Andrea are actually protecting her already. Mm -hmm. And that's just two. Dale would do it. T-Dog would do it. I think even Carl, given the chance to get to know her better, would. Yes. Literally everybody here would protect Beth. Yes. Every single time. And I think this also kind of goes on. Like, she, she's asking for a suicide pact because even at this point, she realizes she might be too afraid to go through with it. Mm -hmm. And that's just another sign that she doesn't actually want to die. Right. But she can't see it because of how her mind is at the moment. Right, exactly. At the public works, this time we see the scene that we saw at the beginning. But when Shane goes in the bus, there's no problem. He can go right in. The walkers are far behind him. He can shut that door. There is no problem. Yeah. And yeah, this is a continuity issue. It could also be a perceptual issue. As mm -hmm. you know, maybe this time we're seeing things from a more um, 
objective perspective where before it was his perspective and mm-hmm. he, he had he felt like he had art but you know what that's just justifying a continuity here correct he baits them again we see with the cutting of the knife and the blood uh and then closes the door on the walkers he's kind of like a weirdo um so my question to you is how long does the zombie pathogen that spreads from a bite or a scratch last on a knife if shane is killing some zombies and then goes to cut his own hand does he get the zombie pathogen in his hand that makes him be a zombie quicker if we are going with the uh, komodo dragon model where what's actually killing you from a zombie bite or zombie blood is the sheer amount of uh, toxic bacteria and other things then yeah it'll take 14 days to four months to get that to just die from sitting on there. Mm-hmm. So that being said, uh, when you're considering your your gear for the apocalypse, consider having two knives. One uh, being, you could be a folder, but this one is a utility knife for doing things that you might come in contact with your mouth or your bloodstream. And then the other one is specifically for killing the zombies or dealing with things that you are never going to have in your body. Or maybe you stop cutting your own hand. You shouldn't cut your own hand. You are, right. You're correct. But you might need to, for example, cut open a fish or right. some other things. You want to have a separate blade just for that. But that being said as well, uh, depending on what the timeline is for Shane's crazy stuff, I wonder how long it's going to take. We should, we should look at this and see how long yeah. it's going to take for him to go full on crazy. Because we know that the zombie-ism, you reanimate in 8 to 18 hours. It it was a few minutes to 8 hours. Mm -hmm. And it will take quite a while for this zombie pathogen to finally kill him. Right. At the farm, Maggie and Beth, still arguing. (laughs) Andrea comes um, in and says, Maggie, why don't you go take a rest? I will watch over Beth. Um, and then she gets the opportunity to tell Beth about her suicide feelings. Awesome. Yeah. But Andrea doesn't try to just reason. She basically just like opens the door and is like, go ahead, go, go do what you want to do. The pain is always going to be there. Deal with it. <laughs> basically. It's always going to be there. You just learn to make room for it. And, you know, even then, she hasn't really had time to process her own pain. Not really. Right. Not really. Yeah. At the public works, Rick cries to grab Randall. And Rick is seriously considering just leaving Shane because of everything he did. So Shane's in the bus and sees them get in the car and start to leave. But then we go back to the farm first. And Maggie comes back in to check on Beth, who is not there, but she can hear crying from the bathroom. And you can also hear glass breaking. Mm -hmm. And Lori comes in and Maggie tells her that she left her with Andrea. And Lori's like, what? (laughs) Excuse me? So she takes the fireplace poker and basically tries to break the door open. And we see that Beth has broken her mirror and tried to slit her wrists. And uh, you can see as soon as she's done it, she immediately regrets it. Mm-hmm. She's like, oh my gosh, what have I done? I don't actually want to die. But then we go back to Public Works and Rick is grabbing all the guns. Then he sees that the safety guys don't have bites yet again. But they've already remarked on it before. Right. Yeah. But he's seeing that there are more of them, I think. Mm-hmm. Shane is still fighting the zombies in the bus. Okay, well, this is where Rick and Randall actually drive up to the bus. They like kind of go in back up towards the back way and then Shane gets in. They break out of the gate with the car and now all the walkers are loose like in the street. Mm-hmm. Like, Aah. And uh, Randall is actually duct taped to the driver's seat. There's duct tape wrapped around his neck uh-huh. and the the headrest so he can't go anywhere but he can still drive. He's driving, yes. Yeah. And it's got, I thought that was kind of a funny that, that solution. That was funny, yeah. <laughs> Uh, But then (laughs) we're going to deal with the uh, next part of Beth's suicide attempt where Andrea comes running towards the house. She somehow has heard what is happening. Don't know from whom because there's really nobody around that saw what happened. 
But Maggie comes out to confront Andrea. And then she banishes Andrea from the house because Andrea's way, kind of dangerous. Yes. I do understand what Andrea is doing. From a logical perspective, I don't agree with it, obviously. But I understand what she's doing. She's basically saying, you think you want this. I'm going to give you this so you understand that you don't want it. Mm -hmm. Because for some reason, she thinks that's what happened to her? Maybe? She thinks that she didn't get that opportunity to come to that threshold. Yes, she did. Yeah, she, she did. She totally did. But she Dale blames... gave her that opportunity. Yeah. But she holds it against him because he also said, well, if you're going to do it, I'm going to do it. He actually did do the suicide pact. And that is what forced her to realize it, but realize it sideways and now doesn't see that she realized it. Mm-hmm. Right. Sorry, I got fired up about that for a minute because I was like, oh, this is so aggravating, Andrea. But, you know, Lori <laughs> does kind of get, like, where Andrea's coming from. Mm -hmm. And she sees the bright side of what just happened. To And she kind of tells it just so that she can be like, don't be quite so mad at her. Maybe. She's still kind of being stupid. But don't be so mad. At her. Right. Yeah. I, I think this, this was also a moment that I just was like, Andrea... No. <laughs> no. Now that we're leaving Public Works, uh, they have Randall tied up back again in the trunk. And they have headphones back on his head because he's no longer driving that car. Mm -hmm. the, uh, <laughs> the song playing is called Driver's Seat by Sniff in the Tears. And it, it's the part of the song right before the bridge. It's still part of the, the chorus mm -hmm. right before the bridge happens. And then you get into the bridge. The lyrics are, take your place in the driver's seat. Doing all right. A little driving on a Saturday night. And come what may, going to dance the day away. And this seems like it's a party song about enjoying driving. It is not. Uh, mm. According to the writer, Paul Ritchie, the song is actually about the fragmented, conflicting emotions that occur at the end of a relationship. Take Your Place in the Driver's Seat offers some glimmer of hope through the power of positive thought. This is talking about the way that Rick and Shane's friendship is actually officially over. Yeah, good point. And they have seen each other for what they are. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, okay, you're going to have to shape up or ship out. Right. Then they put Randall back in the trunk and they have a discussion about how they're going to have to kill Randall. But Rick wants to take the night to think about it, which is what he said from the get-go, mm -hmm. right? He gives Shane an ultimatum. You're with us. You need to follow and trust. If you're not with us, you need to go bye-bye. Mm -hmm. And Rick is putting a lot of faith in Shane at this point that Shane's actually going to deal with the ultimatum. Because really, as we all know, that's not his only option. He could just go crazy on everybody and... That's how it is. But if he goes crazy on one person, he's going to have to go crazy on everybody. Literally everybody. Mm -hmm. And he will lose everything. There is a new song. It's Civilian by Y Oak. And here are the lyrics. I am nothing without pretend. I know my thoughts. Can't live with them. I am nothing without a man. I know my, th my faults, but I can't hide them. I don't need another friend when most of them I can barely keep up with. Them. Perfectly able to hold my own hand, but I still can't kiss my own neck. And this song is about understanding that sentimentality keeps you from getting over your past. And you can sometimes keep somebody in your life where, even though they can't be what you need them to be. And mm. again, this is Rick and Shane. Rick has been keeping Shane in his life because this guy was his partner, his best friend since childhood. Mm-hmm. But Shane is not the same person anymore. No. So Shane sees the walker in the field again. It's supposed to be this poetic circle of, of things that is happening. But this is bad continuity. Because that same walker would not be still on the passenger side of the road if they're returning from where they were. They saw the, the walker driving to the location on the right-hand side. Driving back, it would have now been on Rick's side of the road. And it's not... Which means that this zombie that Shane is, you know, 
identifying with from the way that he looks at it is not just dead inside, but is going around in circles. Mm-hmm. Just like Shane. So what is the title of this episode mean besides the fact that they want to find somewhere 18 miles out which seems to me to be an arbitrary number of 18 miles uh that he wants to put in i feel like there's a deeper meaning here well you know you can't ask me for a deeper meaning without me going really weird here (laughs) so um the hebrew language by the way every letter has a numerical meaning and words can be added up that way 18 is the numerical value of the Hebrew word chai, which means life. It is a deceptively simple two-letter word made up the, of the letters ched and yud. And when they give gifts, they give it in increments of 18. But it has another significance. It expresses prayer and the merit of charity being given to stand for us. So this is a lot like where Rick is giving Shane the benefit of the doubt and is using that like, I am actually a moral person. I'm going to give you this charity of continuing to be with us Mm -hmm. even then. Um, So from many commandments of the Torah, Jews are reminded of these laws. Uh, You will live through the people that you've given charity through. It's also a reminder of how a person should live as ethical moral beings like Rick wants to be. Um, And he's trying to get Shane to live by these ethical rules, but it's not necessarily true. But the problem is, 18 is also the numerical value for chait, which is sin. So you have 18 miles out, both charity as virtue and sin, which are the two characters that we're following. I don't know if I just kind of Pulled that out of my butt. Maybe. But um, there you go. That's fun. Uh, so thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Walking Dead. Uh, Sunday of the Dead. Next week, we are going to talk about Season 2, Episode 11, Judge, Jury, and Executioner. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Lainey on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time, Geek Out.